spring here. And I noticed, I worked in my garden this afternoon and it was so nice. And the birds were singing and yeah, it's, I'm, I'm getting hopeful. We have more light every day. The evening starts later and later. Although tonight we had some bizarre chemtrails, I took a lot of pictures because this pattern, pattern I had not seen yet. But anyway, um, whatever is in the chemtrails, uh, we can feel it when you drive a car. You can feel it in your throat afterwards. At least I can. And uh, I do some things with oregano and stuff to get anything out that shouldn't be in there in my body. So I hope to stay healthy enough, enough to do the minority of one report for ages on words. And tonight I have my beautiful guest again, Lorraine Moray, huge scientist, archaeologist, historic person, uh, anthropologist, uh, nuclear whistleblower. What are you not? <laughs> Welcome, Lorraine. Thank you very much. So, um, we decided to talk tonight about some diseases. And as a medical research journalist, I started um, with investigating vaccines. And I found that there is not one safe vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I found in the history of vaccination that vaccination is based on two fraudulent pieces of science. One uh, by Edward Jenner, who was not a doctor. He bought his title from a Scottish university for 15 guineas. <laughs> and... The one thing that he did right is that he had noticed that the cuckoo puts her eggs in the nest of other birds. That he got right. But the cowpox vaccination is a load of crap, literally in our veins since 1798. And he was the first person, by the way, to compromise the human genome with RNA, DNA, and other stuff from other species. Nobody speaks about that ever, because still it's going on with every vaccine, the cell substrates, meaning the media where the viruses and the bac bacteria are being um, cultured upon for the vaccines, it's all animal material. And we get into our veins and bodies stuff from these animal cells and information on other levels also. It can even be as bizarre. I was with Dr. Fiera Scheibner. Uh, she is the world-renowned um, vaccine damage specialist, expert, in Australia, and she had a woman visiting her who could smell and hear like a dog because she had had a vaccine based on dog cells. Yeah, it's bizarre, and I wouldn't have believed it if anybody else had told me that, but because it was Dr. Viera Scheidner, I knew it is the truth because she never makes anything up. She is a scientist through and through, and she never makes anything up. She never says anything that she cannot prove. So, Loren, vaccines is a factor. Radiation is a factor. And food is a factor that can make us ill. And what I have found is that the people behind the curtain, so to speak, they have not left one option behind to manipulate us in all these things. And what I see is that often you can speak of binary weapons. 
-hmm. meaning the vaccines will bring something into your system and the radiation will activate it. So, um, about radiation and vaccines, maybe it's, it's a good idea to start with pregnancies because that's the beginning of life. And if we are being compromised in our genome or in other ways already then, uh, what sort of life will we have? Well, first of all, um, in the history of the development of humanity, um, vaccines are very, very new. So is the, uh, there's always been background radiation from minerals and from the sun on this planet. And over time, uh, living systems have developed protector molecules that can mostly neutralize uh, the amounts of natural radiation in the background. It doesn't always protect, but uh, that mechanism is there in all of us. Now, um, indigenous people, and these are people who live in traditional ways on traditional diets, um, they have they tend to be very very healthy and the children have disease free childhood and it's because they're eating properly they're getting the right nutrition um they aren't eating any processed foods and they're eating a very balanced diet because their bodies and their traditions tell them what to eat and when to eat it and it's even ritualized, especially around a pregnant woman. Um, <clears throat> so the Hawaiian, the native Hawaiians and other indigenous people know that when a woman is carrying a baby, it's very, very important what she is eating for uh, to make sure that she gives birth to a healthy baby. And they also know that a pregnant woman on a special diet where all the women collectively care for her, at least the ones in her family and extended family. And so there's a protocol. I, I know Korean women uh, who went through pregnancies and um, they had to eat certain foods every day during the pregnancy. And there was a mother or a grandmother or whatever there to make sure they did and to prepare it. And then for three months after the baby was born, um, they had a different diet to, um, to boost the, uh, the chances of the baby surviving. And in Asia, uh, they don't name a baby or uh, christen it or whatever they do until it's 100 days old because the death rate um, infant death rate is so high or used to be so high in those countries and, and regions. So um, we have more prenatal care now. We have um, much cleaner water and better sewer um, practices, sewage practices, so that we live in a um, healthier environment. But um, it's our immune system inside us, ultimately, that prevents disease. And what has happened is all of the things that made people healthy, that they learned about over 50 or 60,000 years, um, have been taken away one by one. And it's all to compromise and to destroy our immune system so that uh, people who own the oil companies can sell this patent medicine uh, to cure us, uh, but it's just a Band-Aid. It does not uh, restore the immune system to a healthy state because then we wouldn't need their patent medicine. We also call it snake oil in the United States. Yes. And it was uh, the Rockefellers. Uh, John D. Rockefeller was notorious. His, he and his father sold snake oil. So, 
who is leading much of this genocide globally? Well, it's John D. Rockefeller. I'm sorry, it's David Rockefeller, this old, 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 withered, uh, shriveled man uh, in his 90s in a wheelchair, and he's still hell-bent on leather to uh, kill as much of the population as he possibly can. And it's the Rockefellers who came up with the, uh, the, the, um, the chemical cure, uh, chemotherapy for cancer. First they cause it and then they sell you the cure for it. And they had, um, uh, because they had a petroleum company, they provided poison gas weapons in World War I. And uh, that would be to the American military and probably other militaries too. So when um, World War I was over, they had all this surplus um, gas, poison gas weapons that they didn't want to throw it away because then they wouldn't have a profit. So uh, somebody said, well, why don't we just inject it into the veins of people with cancer and see if it kills the cancer before it kills the patient. We usually yes, kill the patient first. Yes, it was James Ewing in 1942 who took the the nerve gas of World War One on uh, special cancer cells, and he said to his friends at Yale University, "You try some too," and that's yeah. the beginning of the chemotherapy. Right. And, uh, I just finished a article in a special about cancer and I delved into the history of cancer. And when you go to the uh, Sloan Kettering Medical Center, the history of that hospital starts with Marion Sims. And if you look at the history, you see the start of radium. Um, that was before uh, James Ewing started with uh, the, the chemotherapy. And when you read the history of the Sloan Kettering Medical Center, you have to really dig deep because they themselves don't tell you that story, of course. But uh, you can find it easily. And um, that is the beginning of what we now call the knife, the ray, and the chemo. Yeah. And in 1926, by the way, there was a meeting in Lake Mohonk in New York State. And there, 250 doctors came together and sort of made a deal how to teach the public about what cancer is and what they should do. So it's basically just a scenario that they wrote and that they have been repeating ever since. Right. It's amazing how patients are obedient and the doctors, they don't know anything else but what they have been taught in the hypnosis at the university. So they repeat the story also that you need to be operated upon or you need to be radiated or you need to have chemotherapy. And when people, when patients don't want to do that route, they start to threaten them, like saying, oh, but with this sort of cancer, you only have two more months to live. And I call that medical voodoo, and it's based on nothing. I call it medical terrorism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there are many, many people who want to go a different route they want to try things that go with the body instead of against it because everything that comes from big pharma is basically war against the body that's right so that's yeah um i i work with indigenous people native americans First Nation people of Canada, the uh, Hawaiians, all over the world. And I read this book by Dr. 
Winston Price. And he went around the world in the 1930s. He was a dentist. And his wife went with him. And they studied indigenous people living on their indigenous diets and their state of health. And then they also studied indigenous people in contact with Western foods and society. And what he found was that indigenous people living on their indigenous diets had very healthy children. They had no diseases, no cancer. That was almost, it was so rare. Uh, it, it was just very, very rare. And um, they had disease free happy childhood. Uh, as soon as they came in contact with Western culture and Western food, the processed sugar, uh, other other things, they their health started going downhill. And, and they, their teeth, their teeth. And their, and their teeth, especially the bridge of the mouth uh, in the jawbone was not uh, big enough for the teeth that you inherit from your parents, the shape and the size and everything. Um, and um, they uh, also, let's see the bridge. Oh, they had extra teeth growing down from the roof of their mouths. Uh, the teeth were crooked. They, they rotted and fell out of their mouths. And a, a rotten tooth, a tooth with uh, an abscess or cavity is a low grade um, uh, persistent infection in your head, which is very, very dangerous. You don't want any infections in your head because it can travel to the brain. Um, so they just didn't thrive and um, it's, it's nutrition they're not getting. So they don't do as well in schools because their, their brains aren't working right. Um, lots of bad things about Western food. And recently in the Fukushima disaster, a medical doctor who was a homeopath, um, uh, let's see, no, it's, uh, um, what is it called? Um, macrobiotic, he was a macrobiotic follower or practitioner. And so when Fukushima happened and he lived in Fukushima prefecture, so he was right there on the doorstep. Um, he put all of his family members, people he, who worked for him on the macrobiotic diet. And he told my friends who were traditional healers in Japan, uh, they arranged 20 speaking tours for me in Japan. Um, they uh, told me that he said the uh, Japanese in Fukushima prefecture who were on Western diets or eating Western food, all of them got sick, radiation, illness, cancer, everything um, after Fukushima. But he said no one who he'd been treating on the, on the macrobiotic diet or family members or workers no one got sick. So you see, it's the energy, it's the wavelength, um, it's the frequencies that our cells are operating at. Our whole body is an electrical system. And so when one part of it or one cell or a group of cells is on the wrong frequency, that is disease. And Unfortunately, Western science wants to treat that with chemicals that don't really address that 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 cell or that diseased area is off frequency. It just masks that. And um, so the indigenous people know this. And I learned this also from Dr. Price's book. Um, the uh, cells have to be restored back to the correct frequency. And in uh, Russian and uh, uh, Eastern European uh, medicine and, and practice practitioners treating people for illnesses, they use light therapy or they use 
uh, frequencies that are transmitted into the body or the diseased area. And there's no invasive treatment at all. You don't even take medicine. You just simply use energy in the right form to restore your body, the diseased area, back to the correct frequency. And then all the symptoms disappear. Yeah, and because we are a vibration. Right. the DNA level. Yeah. Right. And um, the, these uh, frequency treatments are great. They really do work. And what indigenous people know is uh, just as by trial and error and observation is that a certain plant, certain root bark from a certain plant, uh, nuts and seeds, leaves um, have different frequencies. And so they learned how to use certain plants for certain illnesses and ailments. And um, it's uh, in the United States, no doctors will even address pain. And it's because the Rockefellers are probably the biggest drug dealers in the United States. So they want people to go on heroin or other drugs uh, to treat their pain uh, because they make bigger profits off of it than curing them. And um, so, um, if, for instance, every culture has their way of treating different illnesses. And it's the kitchen, the kitchen remedies, or, you know, you go to the drugstore, but usually you get poisoned at the drugstore. And when mom gives you something out of the kitchen, it usually works really well. Yeah, it's, it's basis of uh, Ayurveda, for instance, and, and uh, traditional yeah. Chinese medicine works with herbs. Right. And they have also frequencies, of course. Yeah. Right. And so the seeds, the nuts, the root bark, the flowers, all the parts of the plant or trees have a particular frequency. It's unique to each one. And so the native people have learned uh, what what helps what ailment and i even have a big encyclopedia um, of all the native american tribes in america and what plants they use for what diseases and it's different from one tribe may use pine needles for something and another tribe uses pine needles for something different and a different ailment so they um they cross over into different diseases as well, but it's just the traditions of each tribe. And um, it's really, really interesting because I, I started really paying attention to this when I read Dr. Price's book. And in it, he had a story in British Columbia about a native man, a First Nation man, who was sick and he went to the hospital and after about two or three days, the doctors came in and wanted to talk to him. They said, you have diabetes. How did you survive? They said, are you on any medicine? He said, no. And they said, but how did you survive? You can't survive with diabetes unless you're treating it. And he said, oh, I drink this tea every morning. Probably the medicine man gave it to him. And they said, well, what is the tea made out of? And he said, well, it's the root bark from the devil's club plant. It's a shrub and it grows along the west coast of North America. So I can even go out in the woods here along the coastline of the San Francisco Bay Area and I can harvest that. And then I met a medicine woman from Vancouver Island and asked her about it. She said, oh, yeah, she said, I can, I can even completely cure diabetes. And um, so she told me how she gathers herbs and plants and everything and dries them. And she has a special place to store them. And um, it does really, really work. And essential oils are very good medicinal cures because of that. That's basically part of the native treatment is the essential oils. Um, and um, so then I started asking indigenous people in different tribes and around the world, what is your cure for diabetes? Well, the Hopi Indians 
in the southwest part of the United States, they use burdock. And burdock is a very, very long, thin root. It's like four feet or three feet long. And um, it's part, a big part of the Japanese diet. Well, that's what the Hopis use. Then I went to Hawaii and I said, what do you use to cure diabetes? And they said, oh, we use the noni. The noni, they're these green, kind of heavily looking, uh, they look like dinosaur eggs or something. Um, yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. Um, and if you walk around the island to uh, areas uh, that were once uh, living areas for the native Hawaiians, you always see noni bushes growing. And when you see a noni bush growing out in the middle of nowhere like that on, you know, just basically on basalt, um, lava flows, you know that was a settlement for native Hawaiians. And um, so they use that and you'll see these big trucks barreling down the roads in Hawaii out in the country full of noni fruit all the way to the top of the of the truck and they're delivering it to stores or customers or whatever. And uh, then I went to Japan and I went and stayed with the Ainu people, uh, a woman who's the spokesperson for the Ainu. She was all over the world. Those are the indigenous people of Japan. And so she showed me all her herbs and plants and everything that she goes and, and gathers every year. And she invited me to come and gather plants with her. And I wish I could have done it uh, before Fukushima happened because, um, of course, the whole environment is radioactive now. But you see, um, everything we need that can cure us is probably within 20 feet of our front doors. And a Mexican doctor told my brother that. My brother stepped on a stingray when he was surfing. And it's really painful and it has this horrible poison in it. So my brother got in a taxi and the driver drove him all over the place looking for a doctor. And finally, $50 later, um, he was sitting there with the doctor and the doctor said, oh, any any cure is within 20 feet of your own front door he said go right back to the same spot where you stepped on the on the stingray and look at this plant and so my brother <laughs> forked out another 50 dollars to get back to the beach and there was the plant you know 15 feet from the um, the water line and he picked the leaves and he packed it on the the wound and I was cured just like that. It was done. Yeah. I, I work with the essential oils. I have done that for the last 30 years. Yeah. They're wonderful. And I always have lavender oil with me. Yeah. And I mean, my, my eldest son had a, had a motorbike and he had fixed something on it. And it was summer. He had his swimming trunks on and he was going to test ride the thing. And then the brakes blocked and he went with his bare body 20 meters over the asphalt. Yeah. Oh. So in he came looking like a piece of raw meat with yeah. grass and sand and oh. God was there. Yeah. And nobody was supposed to come near him. And the only thing that I did is that I had this little bottle with lavender oil and I put it everywhere where it was raw and open and now you have to really look for a scar oh wonderful it healed beautifully and no infection nothing yeah and, it, mm -hmm. and when, when, my, when my daughter was was little uh she would have a friend playing and when they hurt themselves, then Camille would say, oh, go, come to my mother, she has lavender. And then the kid would want to show the trophy wound when the mother came to pick her up. And there was no trophy wound anymore <laughs> because the lavender yeah. had taken care of it already. <laughs> yes, you see, everything is already there. We don't need yes. all this extra attention from oil companies and pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. And 
a medical profession that's been brainwashed to uh, approach medicine and treatment of patients in a way that does not interfere with the nuclear weapons or the nuclear power program. Exactly. And that will bring no healing or cure, no. but it will keep the wheels of the business going. That's what it is. That's right. I have a quote here uh, from Linus Pauling. Everyone should know that most cancer research is largely a fraud and that the major cancer research organizations are derelict in their duties to the people who support them. Well, Linus Pauling was at Stanford, I believe. And um, this young man uh, contacted me. This was around when I was working on the depleted uranium issue around the 2003 Iraq war. And he said, my uncle works on SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And my father is a medical doctor. He's head of medicine at Stanford. And he said, I hate both of them. I don't like them. I don't like their ethics. I don't like what they're doing. And um, he said, you should see the medical building at Stanford. It has a textured cement exterior. And he said the Nazi swastika is the texturing in that exterior on that building. Oh, wow, why am I not surprised? Well, we know, of course, that with Project Paperclip after the war, many, many, many scientists from Germany were ushered into the United States and they landed indeed in at universities and, and brought their crafts and their satanic ideas with them. Yes, yeah. They did. yeah. And of course, of course, Germany and Austria. Austria is kind of the headquarters for the Jesuits in Europe in in what was formerly the Habsburg Empire. And um, Germany, of course, is Catholic. The Jesuits are actually not religious at all, although they wear priest robes and pretend they are. They're an army, they're military, and they're structured like a military. And Hitler structured his own uh, government and his whole infrastructure on the Jesuit model. So if oh. you want to know how bad they are, just look at Hitler and what he did. They're a oh, hundred million times worse. The Jesuits are a yeah. hundred million times worse. I have their extreme oath. When you read that, you know you have you are, you read satanic literature. Yes. That and, is. Um, you also know they're around and they're in an operational mode when suddenly satanic symbols, satanic practices, uh, satanic memes and things like that suddenly start appearing. And that's exactly what's happening in Yugoslavia now which is now involved in a civil war that the United States planned, uh, at least uh, during the Cold War and probably before that. And it was Dick Cheney who set up what's happening in the Ukraine now, just stripping it for all its wealth and resources and everything. It's like a bunch of vultures from Europe and America um, eating uh, a, a perfectly beautiful, healthy child. Uh, they were so greedy for money, they'll do anything for it. And it's very, very perverted. And then when they're through eating this cannibalizing a country, they completely destroy the environment and they genocide the people. And that's their modus operandi. I call it the, the Jesuit minuet. Embrace Mm. and fold, extinguish. Yeah. Yes, and you see it everywhere. And that is why I have an objection when people say that we are ruining this planet. It's not us. It's not you and me doing that at all. No. It is them. And 
they have put ways of uh, cheap and free energy. They have put uh, real cures for cancer behind bars. Unattainable for us, we cannot reach it, but they use them themselves, no doubt, uh, to stay alive and, and be the fossil that they are. I mean, like David Rockefeller and Elizabeth in England. I yeah. mean, these people are fossils. <laughs> it's amazing that they're still upright. <laughs> Uh, they're still upright because the meanest people are the ones who live to old ages a lot of times. Yes. Fancy and mean and full of malice. I've seen it in my own family. Um, yeah. I think you and I are not like that, and Biggie is not like that. No. Uh, but I think we're going to live to an old age also because we're doing things to counter that. And yep. knowing people that it's they have other choices and better choices. And so um, that is our passion. It's spiritually inspired and, and it's our spiritual energy that um, is unlimited, really, that is enables us to do this kind of work. So let's also remember that spirituality is a very, very important part of good health also. I couldn't agree more. And I have felt that very uh, succinctly when I was in the hospital with my son. I lived with my son for months on end, 24 seven in the hospital in Amsterdam. My son was two years old when, when his problem with cancer started. And he was almost four years old when the chemotherapy killed him. Yeah. But I have seen in that period of that I was there, uh, that happiness and uh, yeah. and uh, on how you say that and an amount of love with their with with no end. I know. Was, you know. Yeah, was going through me. It was amazing, and that was. I mean, there there is always the the, the balance in things. So on the one hand, I had my son and all the all the misery and, and stuff going on there, and the love we shared that was so incredible, so deep and so powerful and so beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the funny thing was that I knew from day one in that hospital that I was a trailblazer there for other children and other parents. Yeah. And so we changed the whole hospital, the two of us. <laughs> That's wonderful. And you see really, really profound changes happen. Yep. They very often turn on just one person. Yes. Very often. I think it's Gandhi who said that. Could or, be, yes. Well, but I, I've seen I've seen that. I'm I always call my my son Philippe my private Jesus. Because he showed me. Yeah. Without him, I, I maybe I would have reached that point, but I don't think so. Uh, he really, he really took me there. He brought me there. But you were willing to listen, and in America, absolutely, my children are generally not listened to. Women also. This is really, in many ways, a very, very negative culture, very negative country, in terms yeah. of how women and children and minorities are treated. Um, in fact, in our constitution, they never mention that women or African Americans or Chinese or Japanese have equal rights. Um, it's not in the constitution. Can you imagine leaving out half the population? Yeah, uh, but they woke up not anymore because women now have to work because they yeah, can make ends meet otherwise, but that means that also the women can be paying taxes now. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And that was the whole, case. That was the whole Rockefeller purpose. Yes. Women live. Yeah. To get the women out into jobs working so that they would have, they would double the revenue on taxes. And so it left American children without mothers, basically. Uh, American children spend something like an average of 14 hours a day in front of the television. 
Desiree, I'd never had a television. I knew it was yeah. head poison when I was very young because I watched my father and my brothers glued to the TV set. And I said, oh, books are much better than, than sitting and watching TV. <laughs> so I was a bookworm. But, um, uh, oh, I wanted to tell you about um, diabetes and how I discovered that radiation is the main cause of diabetes. Um, I started working on the radiation issue in about 2000. And this is 2015, so this is 15 years later. And um, so I spent uh, 10 years, 18 hours a day, doing nothing but reading all the science and learning the science on radiation and radiation-related illnesses. And one of the last living Manhattan Project scientists, Marion Falk, um, he was um, a wonderful man. And he had always wanted a student. He wanted to teach, but he was working in the nuclear weapons laboratories. And he actually made the hydrogen bomb work for the US government. And so I would go to his house and we would sit and talk. And he taught me the philosophy of science. He taught me, oh, so much that I've been able to utilize in order to um, educate the public as you're doing on these very difficult issues. And, um, oh gosh, now I forgot what I was going to tell you about him. Uh, oh, anyway, I was... I was interested in diabetes. And one day I was, uh, what was I looking at? Um, oh, the New York Times. And it had 10 full pages on diabetes in New York City and, and in American Black. And so I read the whole thing and I found these maps. There was a map of New York City there was a map of the United States, and there was a world map of incidents of diabetes. And in the New York City map, the diabetes was the highest in Harlem, which is an African-American community, in Brooklyn and the Bronx. Well, those are poor areas, and a lot of immigrants live there, but uh, there are Blacks mixed in there, too. And um, I said, oh, well, everybody in New York City is drinking the same water. So it's not in the water. It's got to be in the food. And then I worked with a group of scientists. Dr. Ernest Sternglass was one of them. And what we discovered through studying the milk boards in each state is that the state milk board in each state was making sure that the most contaminated milk from dairies around nuclear power plants, that milk would go into the mom and pop stores in black neighborhoods all over America. And so we looked at um, birth rates, infant mortality, radiation related illnesses in the women and the, the families in those communities. And sure enough, they had higher diabetes, higher prostate cancer, higher breast cancer, higher infant mortality. And then we plotted by year the, um, the for instance, infant mortality because it's more, infants are more sensitive to radiation. So you're going to get a bigger spike in death rates. And um, we plotted the releases, accidental releases or or disasters or whatever in the local nuclear power plants. And there was a 100% correlation. If there was a leak of radiation and, and released, it was released into the environment, the infant mortality went up exactly almost on the same day. And um, so that was New York City. And then I looked at the US and the, the diabetes was at the same latitude right across the United States and if you and the the wind is moving because of the jet stream and other uh, tropospheric circulation from west to east. 
primarily. And um, so I went, oh, well, if you go from New York City and you follow that trend across the United States going west, it goes right to the Nevada nuclear weapons testing site where the U.S. government tested 1,300 nuclear bombs. And then I looked on the global map, and it was the same thing. There was a rubber band of diabetes in the northern hemisphere in the same latitudes that the U.S. and Russia did heavy, heavy bomb testing. And in the southern hemisphere, it wasn't as pronounced, but it was there, that same latitudinal distribution and that's where the British tested nuclear weapons in Australia, Maralinga, and the French tested in Tahiti. So there with three maps, I knew what the main cause of diabetes was. Then I went to, to Japan. I took Dr. Sternglass, Ernest Sternglass, on a speaking tour for a month. And um, one of the dentists showed us the vital statistics of Japan. It was a big book. And Ernest said he was standing on a bullet train going 180 miles an hour, barreling down, down uh, the island of Honshu. And he said, I have to have that book, Loren. I have to have that book. That's the most complete vital statistics that I've seen anywhere in the world. That's terribly important for the work we're doing. We collected over 6,000 baby teeth and measured the radiation in the teeth. And we discovered that radiation levels are higher in American children's teeth, baby teeth, um, after bomb testing than during bomb testing. And so we looked around and the only thing that could be producing fresh fission products, Strontium-90, was nuclear power plants, the reactors. And sure enough, that, right. that's what it was. And um, so we got the book, and I took all of the, um, the numbers. Uh, they're compiled uh, by prefecture for the whole country. This is for Japan. And that record is very meticulously detailed and well-kept and accurate. And it goes all the way back to 1918. 98. So you have a baseline, a real baseline for pre-man-made radiation disease rates. And um, that, that was just fantastic. And then I also found a book by uh, Dr. Haviland, who was a ge geologist in England in the 1800s. He did the first cancer mapping survey so how does cancer relate to the geography and the geology? And he published it in about 1882, but it's from, it's from the Cancer Registry 1850 to 1860 in Cumbria, England. And the highest cancer rates were along riverbanks and shorelines because it's washed up on the shorelines, the radiation sticks onto clay particles in moving water and that those clay particles still uh, floats up and, and ends up on the shoreline and then the winds loft it into the atmosphere and people inhale it and uh, get um, not just lung cancer, they get other illnesses too. So um, I started to realize that good health has a lot to do with the environment. In fact, you um, we can't have uh, better health than what the state of health the environment is in because we're living in it, we're consuming food from it, we're drinking water from it. And um, Americans are taught in universities and generally in our culture that um, the environment has nothing to do with health. They're totally separate, different topics. And man, if you go to conferences that you start talking about linking diseases to the environment, you get dogpiled by a bunch of loony brainwashed scientists who don't want to hear it. But um, I've had a very, very, very good response to people uh, by 
explaining to them how illness and disease is related to the state of health that the environment is in. Yes, and yeah, and the state of the environment is also the state of the food that we have that's also linked. So yeah, doctors always say no, that food has nothing to do with health. <laughs> yeah, right. Dream on. Well, you know, I love all kinds of food. So I've, I've had roommates from all over the world and I've learned different dishes from them. And what I noticed, um, I started cooking uh, Indian um, curry, and it's really just a polo. A polo is a Central Asian dish that everybody's still eating. Uh, the Berbers in North Africa, the the Basques in the in the Pyrenees, uh, the uh, Southeast Islanders. Everybody everybody eats this polo, and basically, it's a vegetable vegetable meat sauce and it's put over rice and uh, thousands and thousands of years later they're still cooking that way I watched the Berbers in the in the produce department in the grocery store in Berkeley and I go to the lunchroom to see what they're eating they're eating polo because that's where they came from their ancient Iranian tribe that ended up in North Africa and in the Pyrenees so um, these uh, food practices and food habits and food preferences, they persist for a very, very long time. And yeah. those are very, very ancient, thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. And boy, are they good. And when I make curries and I put coconut milk and I use really good spices, curry powder and things, uh, cinnamon bark, things like that, I am not hungry for 24 hours because I am so nutritionally satisfied with the trace elements that are in the seeds and the bark and the plant parts that compose the curry powder. And um, uh, you don't consume as much food because you're completely satisfied. But if you eat Western food, especially American food, you're hungry all the time. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yes, there is a very nice uh, Indian restaurant in Amsterdam, Shiva, and they they wow. they they cook pristinely. It's it's really clean and nice and everything, and it's great to be there. Yeah. Yes, you like the ambiance. Too. I know, I know what you're talking about. Yes. These wonderful re uh, Nepali restaurants. People from Nepal have these restaurants in Berkeley. And, um, oh, just a minute, my computer's doing something. And their food is so delicious. Yeah. It's kind of a combination of Indian and uh, Chinese. So, mm -hmm. Some of it's very mild and, and not spicy, but if it's spicy, man, it's really spicy. Oops, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm off then. <laughs> I'm gone. But yeah. yeah. And Thai, Thai food also is very nice. I love the, the yeah. lemongrass stuff yeah. and the coconut and oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Very nutritious. Very good. Uh, yeah. Very yeah. natural, yeah, yeah, and very inexpensive too. Uh huh. Yeah, and I what I love about Indian food that you are supposed to eat with your hands. Yes, you have yes. this tali, and then you oh yeah, lovely. Yes. Very <laughs> lovely. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so I've learned a lot. Um, talk talk about energy, by the way. Uh, there are Indian cooks who cleanse themselves emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically. They take a bath and they do a mantra or whatever they do, meditation, and then they start cooking. Because ah, it's what, a ceremony. You bring yourself into the food also, yeah. Right. So if your mood is negative, people 
don't like your food because that energy comes into the food and also the way you heat it. So these induction uh, systems that goes very fast, that's a way of heating food not compatible with the human body. So slowly, slowly, slow cook is yeah. the best way. Yeah. With also some uh, raw stuff in combination. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I love, go ahead. Well, I, I love the, the Ayurvedic uh, way of, of looking at food. What does agree with you and what does not? Uh, do you have too much wind? So, hey, too much vata? Okay. S forget about the onions and forget about the, the leek and, and that sort of thing. But take uh, pepper and take things to warm up uh, like that. And it, it really works. It really works. Yeah. Well, I, this, this brings to mind a story. And um, this reporter was interviewing Madame Stravinsky in Paris. And um, I believe that she and her husband were from Russia. And um, so the, the reporter said, well, Madame Stravinsky, what is your favorite food? And she said, well, do you mean when I'm rich or when I'm poor? <laughs> and so, so the reporter was surprised and he said, well, well, tell me both. And she said, well, when I'm poor, my favorite food is this, that it was dried fish and potatoes with sour cream on them, you know, just a basic uh, sort of a peasant dish. And um, she said, and then when I'm rich, and she described some, one of her favorite French restaurants and the, the special dish and everything that probably took a week to make it. But anyway, uh, what that brings to mind is that um, in the times that I've traveled and lived in other countries, I've been in 50 countries, I discovered that it's the poor people who have a better diet than the rich people. Yeah. A diet than the rich people, the poor people have, believe it or not. But yeah. uh, for instance, in Iran, poor people eat brown rice, uh, rich people eat white rice. So all of the nutritional uh, the germ and everything from the, the rice um, grain is polished off of it to make it uh, look nice, pure yeah. white and prestige and so forth. But you can't eat prestige. Um, and it doesn't, the, the polished rice does not benefit the human body. It's, it's all the nutrition has been polished off of it. And so I started looking at uh, diets in poor people in different countries and what the rich people were eating. And it's the same thing that Dr. Price described, where people on their indigenous diets um, were very healthy, uh, but once they came into contact with Western society and all the stupid things that the Western uh, society demands in order to make profits, you pervert everything. Everything that's good, everything that works, is taken away and replaced with something they can profit on and keep us in a state of constantly being repeat business because we never get cured. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That's what I see also, yes. And, and so I had a Chinese roommate a couple of years ago and um, I'm petite, I'm 5'4", I'm not very tall. And um, I weighed about 145 pounds. Well, in high school, I weighed about 117 pounds. And it's not a normal state at all for me to weigh that much. And I just couldn't understand because all I was eating was vegetables and bread once in a while, and but uh, nothing really caloric. So I thought. Um, so I had a Chinese roommate and she said, oh, I don't have time to shop. Could you go to Chinatown? in Oakland and here's a list of, of groceries I want. And I said, sure, I'll do that for you. Cause then I get to learn about them. And then I get to watch her cook them. And so I did that. And I started eating food that I was brought, buying in the Asian stores. And um, uh, I noticed after about two weeks that 
my pants were way too big and I just didn't know what had happened. And then pretty soon everything's way too big. I mean, way, way, way too big. And then I was going in my closet to get other clothes to wear and they were way too big, even though they were smaller sizes. Well, I lost 50 pounds in two months without even trying. And I felt much better. And I've never put that weight back on. That's about four years ago. So um, we need to stay away from processed Western food. Go to farmer's markets and buy straight from the farmer's a head of lettuce that you buy at a farmer's market from a good farmer will be fresh in the refrigerator for at least two weeks. If you buy it in a grocery store, if it's fresh after a week, it's still edible, you're lucky. So um, they're, they're, and it's a lot cheaper at the farmer's markets also. And then you get to go out in the sunshine and go shopping and in the fresh air. And a lot of times they have live music playing and it's just fun to be in a market it's really fun you bargain and you can taste things and it's just really really fun so um and our farmer's market has a hungarian selling california dates um Hmong people who were brought over when the vietnam war was over they're wonderful people um chinese japanese um uh, Eric, Filipinos, everybody's there, and they're all working at their tables, selling their goods, uh, Mexicans. It's really, really fun, and it's a rich experience, and you go home so happy with this huge um, basket of food that sustains you for probably two weeks. Yeah, we have a, a, a street in Amsterdam, the Albert Kuyp Uh-huh. There is a market where all sorts of people have their wares and also food stuff, right. fish, a lot of fish, and it's it's really fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been to those markets. Yeah, uh, love Amsterdam. I had so much fun in Amsterdam. Yeah, well, uh, I think it is a bit messy these days. It's not the way it used to be. Um, and I'm living up north from Amsterdam where it's very quiet, very countryside, very still. And I'm always very glad when I can go out of Amsterdam again. <laughs> yeah. With all the bustle and the noise and the stuff, you know. I know. I know. But, I know uh, that Amsterdam is really an amazing city it's very amazing with an amazing history yes it is yeah yeah the Dutch East India Company and uh, all the, the things that happened in the age of exploration and since then very yeah. very interesting yeah in the most extreme places on the globe you will always find someone from the Netherlands yeah. <laughs> they are everywhere <laughs> right they travel a lot. That's right. Yeah. So um, going back to other radiation related illnesses, um, the, um, the damage to the mitochondria in the cell is very serious uh, because the mitochondria that are inherited from the mother um, and indigenous bloodlines breed their animals through the mother's bloodline and they intermarry based on the mother's bloodline because a lot of the DNA comes from the mother and the mitochondria are probably the most important thing you inherit because that provides all the, they provide all the energy for the body. And uh, they also have RNA and DNA. Now in, um, in the heart and the brain, um, the heart and brain are made up, 50% of the cell is mitochondria. So when radiation exposure is occurring, the uh, particles that are ejected from the nucleus of the radioactive atoms will travel through a cell and kill cells or damage them. And 
it, it can miss the nucleus, uh, which is where the DNA and the chromosomes are, uh, which is your inherit that that determines what what characteristics you inherit. Um, and uh, so the radiation particles can miss the DNA. They can miss the nucleus, but they don't miss the mitochondria. The mitochondria are always damaged by radiation exposure. And the highest uh, mitochondrial uh, concentration is in the brain, cells of the brain and the heart because they use the most energy. And so when nuclear technologies are introduced, nuclear bombs started in 1945, Weapons testing started in about 1952 for the United States. Um, nuclear power plants, well, they came on like in the, the 50s and 60s. Um, and you can see big increases. The largest increases in death, causes of death, are brain illnesses and heart disease. And cancer is um, not so high. It's the damage to the brain and the, and the heart that um, are at much higher rates. And it's because of the higher concentration of mitochondria. Now, mitochondrial related diseases that are caused by radiation are chronic, chronic fatigue syndrome, Lou Gehrig's disease, heart, Hodgkin's disease, Parkinson's disease, um, Alzheimer's. There are many illnesses that are linked to damage of the mitochondria by, by ionizing radiation. And um, even the Sandia Nuclear Weapons Laboratory did a paper. Uh, they investigated and tested a lot of uh, Gulf era soldiers. And what they determined was they had higher Parkinson's, higher chronic fatigue syndrome, and some of these other radiation-related illnesses in the Army personnel higher than in any other military. And it's because the Army handles more of the depleted uranium and mini nukes and, and those sorts of things. They're more exposed because they're on the battlefield shooting these things and launching them into targeted populations. And it's all part of the global depopulation agenda, which uh, Ted Turner of CNN, uh, David Rockefeller of the Council on Foreign Relations, all of these New World Order um, whores, I guess I would say, prostitutes, um, have talked about this depopulation plan, and it is really serious, and, and the chemtrails are part of it. And what I've seen since January of 2014, 15 is a major increase in chemtrails and it's not just in the u.s or in the bay area san francisco area where i live it's global and i was just talking to a woman married to an astrophysicist in hamburg in uh, heidelberg germany and she said what are these chemtrails we're going out and choking to death every time we go out we come back choking and coughing and uh, it's horrible. Well, that's chemicals that they're spraying deliberately. The military is doing it in almost every country in the world. The only place they don't have the chemtrails programs is Africa because the population density is so low. It wouldn't give them the kill rate for the expenditure that they want. So Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett have a big foundation. And they set up the program to vaccinate um, people all over Africa. Now, what I am seeing in the U.S. in this past week is news in, in the papers and, and the media through the Internet um, that bill, there's a bill proposed in Congress to make it mandatory for adults in America to have a uh, vaccine through a government-controlled government, -controlled government um, um, program. And why do adults need vaccines? 
Why do adults need vaccines? Children don't. don't need be cold. <laughs> because it's yes. cold, exactly. Yeah. If, if this is another indication that they're using vaccines to damage and compromise our immune system. And then they, they put pathogens in the air. Um, I know we've had a measle break outbreak in the Bay Area just uh, a couple months ago during the winter. This is 2015. Um, they have had an outbreak of typhoid fever in Oklahoma in February when it is so cold there. It's like being in Russia in the winter time. Uh, where did that come from? Um, everybody's getting staph infections. If I don't wear a hat when I go outside every time, I get staph infections, little pustules all along my hairline, styes on my eyelids. I've never had styes. And so I buy povidone, iodine, 10%, the surgical wash, and I dilute it uh, many times so that it just has a light orange color in the water, a tinge. And I put it on a washcloth and I wipe my face every morning before I put any makeup on. I rinse my hair in the shower after uh, with dilute iodine. Um, I rub it on my skin every day and on the belly fat on my stomach. And it, woo, it goes right into the bloodstream. And even a friend of mine had an intestinal uh, infection where there was a puncture in the wall of the intestine and a cyst formed around that puncture and then the bacteria collected in that cyst and she is in the south island of new zealand they wanted to do surgery and cut out her gut and her her all her you know part of her intestine and everything and i said no surgery just rub some of that iodine on the skin over the area where you know that puncture is and she she told me about a month later, she said, Loren, that really worked. Then her friend had a horse that had stepped on barbed wire and had a puncture hole in the hoof. And um, the poor horse couldn't even walk on that leg. And I said, start putting iodine on the leg every single day. It goes into the skin, gets right into the bloodstream. And it was in the bone. And so the vet didn't think he could cure it. I said, just wiping, start wiping that little horse with uh, iodine every day. And in two days, that horse was walking on that, that leg. Yeah, yeah. It can and be that simple, yes. It's that simple. And people with um, diabetes always end up with amputated legs, uh, uh, yeah. more than likely. And it's because of infection. And for some reason, the circulatory system is slow in the legs and the extremities. So you're not getting enough blood pumped through um, to, uh, to fight that infection. And they end up, because the diabetes impacts their immune system, they end up with amputated legs. Well, that doesn't have to happen at all. Everyone with diabetes, actually everyone, should have uh, the iodine povidone wash it's 10 percent iodine you don't need a prescription from it for it if it's not on the shelf in the pharmacy you go ask the pharmacist to um, buy it for you to order it for you and um, i buy 10 tubes one ounce tubes it's like three and a half dollars it's nothing a euro or something and um, i have 10 of those tubes sitting in a in a in a plastic bag somewhere in my bathroom cupboard so that I never run out of it and I have plenty of time um, to go and refill that that supply. Uh, that's very, very important to have. You can use it on babies, animals, um, people. You could just put it in the drinking water of the animal, but it does kill the uh, friendly bacteria in the gut, which are real necessary for digestion. So it's better just to rub it on the skin. But iodine is magic. And when I got staph on my feet from walking outside barefooted after they chemtrailed, I had these big black blisters on the bottom of my feet, the soles of my feet. It took six months 
for those to heal. And um, then I noticed uh, uh, these ring arrangements of pustules on, on the outside of my foot. And um, I just said, where did I get that? Staph is something you usually only see in hospitals. It's probably the main killer in hospitals, in fact. And um, so I put iodine on it, and I could literally see those pustules. The bacteria died in five seconds. It's that powerful. Hangnails. When you have a hangnail and it gets infected under the nail and everything, you just rub that iodine on, and in about four hours, all the pain is gone. That's how effective iodine is. Yes, and that's why they took it out of our bread. Out of our food. Exchange right. it for bromide. Yeah. We have 20% iodine compared to 20 years ago. We only have 20% of those levels that we had in our diet 20 years yeah. ago in the food today. So yeah. every cell in your body uses iodine. It's not just the thyroid. And um, it, it, it helps the whole endocrine system. The uh, adrenal gland, the pituitary gland, and the thyroid gland control and synchronize all of the functions of all the parts of your body. So keeping though that endocrine system, those are the messengers telling who, to, who should dance and when they should dance and how they should dance throughout your body. And if you don't have a synchronized um, mechanism for sending messages to the body, it's through infrared light, by the way, because it travels so rapidly. It, that's how we think, and um, that's how um, our organs and everything signal to each other. It's through infrared light, and that's why they have the Iridium satellite system up there in space because it uses infrared and they're targeting people from space with infrared. They're making uh, brown spots now all over people's skin. I have them all over my arms. I got them in Hawaii when I was um, working with the legislature to get a bill, a depleted uranium bill in the Hawaiian legislature. And I guess the military hit me with infrared and I came back with all these brown spots all over my arms. And I said, where did I get those? And then I happened to be reading one day. And it said, oh, you can cause those brown spots with infrared. So that's what they did. Oh, wow. Gee. I thought, I thought these were uh, liver spots. No, they're from the military, from space, from satellites. And it's just part of defacing people and silencing people which is what fascism is. It's, it's destroying people and breaking them down in every way they can until they're submissive slaves, complete slaves. And that's where we're headed now. And yes, fast. Putin is one of the few sane leaders who um, is doing good things for not just his people, not just for Russia, not just for the oligarchs there, He's doing good things for, for people all over the world. And uh, one of the earlier presidents introduced GMO, or maybe he did and thought it was good in the beginning, but um, he's phasing out GMO uh, food in, in, in Russia. He said, we don't want that here. And the Ukraine was GMO free. All of Europe was GMO free. The Africans said, your ships are not landing in our ports if you have one kernel of GMO corn on it. We don't want your corn. We would rather starve to death. And so finally, the only other countries that would do GMO were Japan and the Philippines. And I was there in both countries when the farmers went into the test plots, the Monsanto test plots, and they smashed all the, the plants that had been planted, the GMO plants, in the moonlight into the mud. They said, no, we don't want GMO in the Philippines or in Japan. No, GMO is, is awful. I, uh, I, introduced, I helped introduce the film uh, The Future of Food in the Netherlands a couple of years ago. 
And then there was one person from our government. He was on the panel afterwards. And in the film, you can see how GMO corn that was brought in by farmers, uh, yeah. because uh, America has, uh, they, they finance uh, the, the corn uh, so that it's cheaper and- Subsidize it. Subsidize, yeah. And um, so farmers are farmers. They got that project produced from uh, America and then they kept some seeds and put it in the ground and then they had GMO corn in Mexico and it spread like wildfire. Dr. Ignacio uh, Chapella. Yes, I, exactly. I organized a speaking event for him in the Berkeley City Hall. He's on the faculty in the microbiology department. He's actually a friend yeah. of mine. Ah. Uh. Ignacio said, I went down to Mexico and came back with samples of wild corn. And he tested them and discovered that there was lab altered DNA in the wild corn. That's where corn originated. It's actually a grass. And um, so he was very, very alarmed about that because once you destroy your original population or DNA source, you can never go back and and to the original stock because he said you always run into problems when you start playing with the DNA. So if that's all contaminated, you can never go back to when everything was good and it worked right and uh, or the original state and redo it uh, once you've made a mistake. So he said, but the GMO, um, he said, there's a there's another um, uh, experiment they're doing in Mexico. They're taking spermicidal corn down there. This is GMO altered, and um, they're reducing the population because the men don't are not fertile. They don't know it. It's they're, they're just having fewer and fewer babies. But it's in the corn. He said that not so bad it's that genie is out of the bottle he said there are a lot worse genies in bottles and it's our duty now to make sure that those really bad genies never get out of the lab test too well they should never be made in the first place exactly and monsanto and cargill those are the two biggest um uh producers of GMO and uh, they've done the most pressure and marketing and everything and a lot of very, very dirty politics and very illegal things to promote GMO. Uh, so it can't be good because the Jesuits own Monsanto and they uh, Monsanto also managed the Oak Ridge Nuclear Weapons Laboratory, which is where all the depleted uranium and nuclear power came out of that, and uh, probably GMO too, at, at some at some uh, uh, at some level. So, uh, when you start looking at the scheme behind these technologies that are very dangerous to living things, uh, you see over and over and over again the um, the Jesuits are behind it. Yeah, well, and what I wanted to say about this guy from the government who was at the discussion panel afterwards for the film The Future of Food, he said something like, "Oh yeah, well, let, let's let's go and try it and then we can control it. We can we can." And the whole room was booing him because that is exactly what the film was all about. You can't control it. When it's the bottle of genie, it's done. That's it. Yeah, well, I remember that promise when World War II was over. The Rockefellers said to all these soldiers coming back and all these new families uh, being put together and babies all over the place, the baby boom. And the Rockefellers said, oh, just sit back now and leave the driving to us. 
and look at the brick wall and ocean of tears that they drove us into. And that's only about 65 years later. Yeah, they had a satanic plan and they stuck to it. Yeah. And, and we, we always have to tell That's right. Yeah. So, um, I, actually, I was thinking um, people in neighborhoods should get together and pool their money and start having a neighborhood drone drone so that um, their little flying planes with video cameras they're using them in ukraine in the war zone the militia the volunteers separatists are doing it and they're 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 great for intelligence you can watch all the cops and what they're doing you can videotape it um you can document anything uh from these drones they're fantastic and if they're using them on us, we might as well use them against them. It's accountability. Yes, it's uh, civil disobedience. And so yeah. it's, it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. It's neighborhood watch. We'll call it neighborhood watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a better, better term. <laughs> yeah, and also, when, when I look where I live here, there is a little green... Uh, piece of land in the middle of this square. If times get bad, I suppose we could have a garden there. Oh, you should have a community garden there. Yeah. Yeah. Have our own vegetables and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Grass is a useless commodity anyway. You can't eat it or anything, and it yeah. costs a lot to maintain it, and then it destroys the um, the balance of nature there too because yeah. it's a mono crop nothing else grows there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's nothing yeah right but yeah uh, as i was saying in the beginning like uh radiation will bring forth so many things that are already a little out of whack in the body it's um it's just a feather yeah that just pushes you a little bit more because your body's already compromised. Yeah. It pushes you over the edge. And yeah. it's not really a feather, it's really more of a sledgehammer, but um, just even one alpha track from one atom of uranium can cause cancer under the right condition. So this is a very, very pernicious, very, very dangerous poison and it gets into atmospheric dust and it travels all over the world and it's completely mixed in one year. So the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are in the Los Angeles drinking water. They've been measured and reported in the British atmosphere. They're everywhere. And what we're seeing is a lot of conjoined twinning. These are babies, newborn babies that are born and they, they are grown together. They're stuck together. And they have, sometimes they share organs so they can't be separated without one dying. Um, and they're weaker so they don't always survive the surgery. Um, but uh, there's a huge increase in conjoined twinning now. And I took a map of a rock and I collected all of the, the, the newspaper stories that I could find reporting conjoined twinning in different cities in Iraq. And what I discovered when I wrote down the numbers on each city is that the cities that have the most U.S. fighting in them with depleted uranium have the largest number or the highest incidence of conjoined twinning. Um, in fact, I mapped the whole world with these uh, media reports of conjoined twins, and I was able to discover and prove that the monsoon rainout season um, has a very, very high uh, conjoined twinning rate in certain areas, even certain islands, for instance, in Indonesia, had higher rainfall. So they had uh, one island had 19 conjoined twins, like in five years. It was amazing. And um, uh, so the conjoined twinning was one tip. And also when I mapped South America, I said, why are all these conjoined twins? 
in certain areas of South America. Then I got a map of monsoon rain out globally, and those conjoined twins in South America were exactly where the Southeast Asian monsoon rains out in, in South America. And five uh, presidents of countries in South America have had cancer within like a five or eight year period. Hugo Chavez was one of them. Whoa. So, so uh, if you if you ha if you ask the right questions, if you look in the right way, then the answers are there. The answers are there. Yeah. And, and the last twin twinning happens in animals and, and plants also. Yeah. Uh, Fukushima has caused conjoined twinning, the weirdest things happening on trees and plants. And there's a tree, this was very early on, the effects were already uh, apparent just within six months of Fukushima happening in, J in Japan. And there are trees there that grow, uh, one branch will be all male reproductive uh, appendages, and another branch will be all female. And so the pollen is carried in the wind and, and cross pollinates. But all of a sudden, after Fukushima, the females were growing out of the males on the same branch, or the males were growing out of the females' uh, reproductive appendages. Uh, so the program was disturbed. Yeah. The whole thing was a mess. And that's that message flow that I'm talking about through the body that tells everything in the body what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And that's what's all messed up. It's the whole messenger system is yeah. messed up now. Yeah, the blueprint is, is off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anything goes now. It's all a DNA wildcard party. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I once read that you can create polio when you have a combination of chemicals and radiation. Well, chemicals are bloody everywhere. I mean, uh, the, the blood of uh, umbilical cord of babies, they found 200 chemicals in that already. Yes. Yes. So when you add Fukushima and Chernobyl and all the other nuclear disturbances let's call it like that uh in the world i expect a lot more polio although I, but i don't think they will call it that no um they call it neurological and neuromuscular disease now yeah, and, uh, so, yeah. they don't call it polio they call it neurological no, no, because there was a vaccine so it can't be polio <laughs> right right um, but that hoax was uncovered um, by Dr. Levan in Alberta, Canada. Years ago, he did a study in Alberta, uh, and it was after the Russians did, the Soviets did the huge nuclear bomb test in the Arctic. And um, all that radiation came right down the middle of Canada into North America and then went east and, and contaminated all of the American continent. And um, the the and the neurological and neuromuscular disease that was named polio, and then they had a whole vaccine program for it, which was bogus. But it's caused by damage to the mitochondria and other parts of the cell from ionizing radiation. And um, when you damage the mitochondria, you have neurological and neuromuscular problems. What was the name of that doctor you you mentioned? Doctor Le, L E. Yeah. And then his last name is Van V A N N. Oh yeah 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 yeah. I yeah. think did I send you his paper? Yeah, you sent it. Yeah, you yeah. sent me that that article. Yeah. You should put that up on your website, uh, because every person living in the northern hemisphere, uh, were. They received radiation from that bomb test. It was the biggest bomb test ever done by the Soviets, and they did it in the Arctic. And um, every person in, nor in the Northern Hemisphere received the equivalent of a chest X-ray uh, from that bomb. And today, in Svalbard, uh, uh, 
region of the Arctic, uh, the, uh, the polar bears have been studied. And because of that bomb test and other testing in the Arctic, the female bears now, female polar bears, have uh, vaginas and ovaries and uteruses, and they're giving life, uh, they're giving birth to live bears, uh, uh, cubs. Uh, but they also have penises and when a female i've seen photos of this when a female gives birth um because of the alterations due to hormonal disturbance from the radiation um the 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 uh, cup comes out of the vagina and it actually goes through the clitoris and the bear gives birth that way it's all messed up and um this is also happening in humans it's called uh, hermaphrodite or hermaphro hermaphrodism yeah and a black athlete a young woman i think she was 17 or 18 in uh botswana land was headed for olympic gold medals she was such a good runner a long distance runner and um so the uh, for some reason the Olympic um, officials decided that they should test her. I think there was an outcry. She was so good that probably the male athlete uh, thought she was a guy, you know, dressed up like a woman. And um, so anyway, there was a demand that she be tested, sex tested, and and everything. And they did a physical exam on her, and. Um, she looked normal, uh, but she had, instead of ovaries, she had testes internally. And um, she, uh, her testosterone levels were high, but they weren't beyond the, the highest limit um, to be accepted as a female. And she was completely mortified. So what the Olympic uh, officials did was they let her keep all the medals that she had because she was a woman and um, but they wouldn't but she had to compete as a male from then on in oh. and right after that happened the uh, Olympic uh, committee ordered that there would be no more sex tests because there's so much hermaphroditism now uh, and there's so many athletes who are hermaphroditic that they didn't want to deal with that issue, but they didn't want it exposed either. The governments didn't want people to realize yeah. how much sexuality is being altered by radiation. Exactly. Yeah. And and what you hear also more and more is children who live in a boy's body, but they want to be a girl and vice versa. It's yeah, and we we also have another radiation indication is when the male population is shrinking and the female population is increasing, and this was first reported, I believe, in the Columbia River, uh, which drains from east to west into the Pacific Ocean. And it's the dividing line between uh, Washington State and Oregon State. And the, uh, the salmon in the Columbia River were being exposed to very high levels of plutonium and other fission products from the Hanford Nuclear Weapons Laboratory, where they made all the plutonium for the U.S. nuclear weapons program. And it was all leaking and dumping into the, the Columbia River. Well, I've seen the women and the men who live along that river, and the same thing is happening to them. And um, the women have, they're very masculinized, and the men are very feminineized. And the salmon were the first indicator. They had a shrinking male population and an expanding female population. And that's a big salmon area, especially for the indigenous people. Um, there were problems in the populations, human populations living along the river. And then uh, there are freshwater otters that live in that river, the Columbia River. And they have 
um, otters and walruses have a bone in their penis to keep it erect so that they can reproduce with females. It's called a baculum. And so people did studies on changes in the baculum of these freshwater otters. And they discovered that the radiation was causing more fragile baculum and smaller and thinner so that sometimes they were breaking during intercourse when the animal was mating with a female and then they couldn't breed anymore after that. So um, there are a lot of subtle changes uh, that have unknown outcomes. It can't even predict what the outcome is going to be. But once you change the altered the DNA like that, you can't go back and fix it. And any uh, damage to the DNA is expressed in all future generations. You can never get rid of that defect. And it is expressed in very strange ways. Sometimes it'll skip generations and then all of a sudden there'll be this horrible, this baby born with this horrible problem. Um, even Farrah Fawcett, the um, Hollywood actress, uh, was born during bomb testing and she was born with cancer in her intestine as a newborn. Now that wonderful woman died of rectal cancer and I thought maybe she'd been having you know anal intercourse or something but it wasn't that. When I found out that she'd been born with cancer from the bomb testing period I knew that her rectal cancer was part of the aftermath of that of that exposure when she wasn't even born and it happened when she was uh, an older adult. So even over your lifetime, whatever a fetus is exposed to in utero is going to determine the state of their health and the path that takes for the rest of their lives. Yes, and also, um that's an, that's another thing, but um, people who had who were hungry during World War II and then got pregnant, that epigenetic message in, in the parent and especially in the mother was brought into the children afterwards. So they have done uh, research in that also. Um, and it's Jeffrey Bland who spoke about this, and he has done research in this area also. But yeah, we we are, and, and that is the message that comes to us because we are vibrational beings, and we pick up all these messages, all these in all this all this information. So you cannot say that you're apart from the world and that it's only there. No, we, we are one. And we have all that same information and the one will probably uh, work with it in a different way than the other, but uh, individually, but uh, we are all affected. We're all connected. Yeah, yeah. We're all connected and we're all connected to the environment and the environment's connected to us. We're yeah. Our brain waves and, and our bodies and our spirituality are even connected to the Earth's magnetic field. And yeah. so what happens up there does matter. And the, the monks in Asia came and found me and they loved the work I was doing. And they told me all kinds of things that I never could have imagined in and if I was in a library reading books for the rest of my life, I could never imagine that what they told me was true. Uh -huh. and they said, don't worry, we know the American government is harassing you a lot. We know what they've done to you. But don't worry, you'll never be alone again. We are protecting you. And now you have gotten yourself onto a spiritual level. Yeah spiritual energy to do what you're doing. And do you know what happened? I started trusting myself and I trusted the universe. And I just sort of free fall through life. 
And when I started doing that, just let go of myself and, you know, silly things I had worried about before or whatever. And I started working on this issue and nothing else because it's so important. Well, it's really interesting, too. Yes. And, um, the right people started coming and finding me. Resonance. And Resonance. Me. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and even animals. Um, my, I have this starling cat, and he, um, he's a really, really good communicator. He's a Siamese. Mm. And um, when, when he's really happy and he's sitting on my lap or he's lying next to me on the bed, and um, he gets into, I guess it's a catatonic state, but I can see, I can feel his energy flowing into me and mine flowing back to him. And actually, 95% of communication is nonverbal. And if you're sitting in proximity to someone within about three to five feet from them, uh, um, the, the, uh, the brain waves and the thinking and the thoughts actually flow back and forth. Uh, you don't need to verbally speak out. That exchange, that communication goes on. And I can tell you, when I worked in Hawaii on the depleted uranium issue, um, I got the army so terrified of me and the fact that I had exposed Hawaii as radioactive paradise to the whole population that um, they wouldn't let me get a single depleted uranium bill into the legislature. I ended up getting 58 depleted uranium bills in legislatures all over the U.S., but they brought a general out of retirement, General Lee, and they put 32 depleted uranium bills in one session in the Hawaiian legislature to block me. Whoa. Well, that backfired. No journalist would interview me, so I went to all the free weekly magazines, you know, that come out on the weekends, and they got into a cover story on the DU issue war, and all of the free weeklies have these wild cover stories on depleted uranium <laughs> for three months while I was in Hawaii. <laughs> so, um, so I did get sort of infamous over there. They'll never forget me. But what's even better is that's a Pacific Rim population, and they have social networks and communication networks that are unbelievable. And they are still hounding all of the Hawaiian legislators in Congress and in Hawaii, in their villages, in, in Honolulu, everywhere. And um, now, uh, this is 10 years later, eight years later, now um, the senators and the congressional members, uh, Hawaiian members of Congress, cannot go anywhere in Hawaii without being surrounded with citizens waving Geiger counters at them and yelling at them. And so now they will only have events that have a high fence temporarily put around them and guards. And so all the citizens are outside of the fence waving their Geiger counters and yelling anyway. So, um, there are all these these things that happen, and, and there was one television story, uh, radio about radioactive Hawaii, with me talking about it and explaining it, and uh, the um, police chief of New York City just before 9/11, um, he tried to get a law passed in New York City because of me. Oh, it was after 9/11, and and it's still radioactive in New York City. And so he tried to get a law passed in New York City that no people could have any air monitoring uh, devices. They could not make any measurements of air quality. They could not have Geiger counters. They couldn't write about it or report about it. And I started a global Geiger counter movement because of what I did in Hawaii. I mean, people started it. I, I just went and did that and it got in the news. And, um, and boy, uh, I don't think he would ever let me in New York City, but the bill failed because it was unconstitutional.
confusion. Oh, good. Yeah. So you never know what the consequences will be or the benefit or what will happen when you do something. You can't have expectations. You just no. do something because you believe it's the right thing to do. And do it and let go of it and let it go where it wants to go. And people pick it up like fairy dust and they do what they want to with it. And it's always better than anything you or I could think of doing. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have that experience as well. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, but if you do it with your whole heart, because you know it is your truth and you have to do it, yes. that is why this program is called the Minority of One Report. Yes, and right, right. That, that was from Gandhi, but you also have this Dr. Walter, Walter Hadwin. He, he said in 1896, majorities are never a proof of the truth. Yeah. And I have always felt like an idiot when I had this idea or this feeling that this was a truth and any, everybody else was going the other way. And then I always thought that I was crazy and, and until I stopped thinking that. I said, okay, let me go with my truth. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> let me do that. And, oh boy, then you can work wonders. Well, one of the best ways to understand disease is to start mapping it and to see what the relationship, what the distribution, what the disease rates and everything are um, in a particular area or region. And then you start to understand what the cause is. And it's usually chemicals or radiation. Yeah. Uh, and, and because I'm a geologist, um, it's really fun. I never thought of mapping cancer. Um, in, in that survey that, um, Dr. Haviland did in England, in Cumbria, which is where Sellafield is, the big nuclear reprocessing plant. Um, he started mapping cancer 1850 to 1860. And I have a list of all the cancers. Um, and believe it or not, in pre-man-made radiation times, this is before um, 1898, uh, something like 50% of the cancers in that registry, and there were, um, I think, over 3,000 cancers registered in the 10-year period, um, they were reproductive cancers in women. So the tissues in the uterus and the tissues in the breast are more sensitive to radiation than uh, what males have and uh, in their reproductive organs. And the reason you get more cancer, higher cancer in the reproductive organs is because of the hormones. So hormone therapy for people in menopause is not a good idea, it gives them cancer. And uh, the natural, um, I was studying the Sumatra rhinoceros, which is going extinct and it's a miniature one and they had just captured a female who had had a um, uh, got her foot caught in a trap and he had to pull her hoof off to get her leg out of it. Uh, so she was limping, but they, they captured her for their breeding program because the older females they had captured were sterile and they, they couldn't conceive. And um, so finally experts came over Dutch experts, German experts, American experts from zoos and, and breeding programs for exotic animals. And um, they figured out that um, rhinoceroses and animals usually reproduce a calf a year. And because the population had dwindled down to such a low number, the individual rhinos were so far apart, they didn't always find each other to mate every year. And because the hormones were cycling the ovaries every month, um, they had too much hormone concentration. And so they got cysts and other 
things in their reproductive organs that presented, prevented them from being fertile. So uh, I said, well, that must be true because we have the same hormones practically as uh, animals. That must be why women, older women are getting higher rates of reproductive cancer. It's because of the hormone therapy. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, when women go on the contraception pill, that is like an elephant in the porcelain cupboard, hormonically speaking. Yes, that's right. And you disturb a very delicate balance, and maybe the rest of the life of, of the woman, it will never get back to normal again. That's right. That's right. So... So all these miracle cures and miracle yeah, this and miracle that, they, all, they have a dark side to them. And it's better to understand uh, what is the best and healthiest state of nature to be. Yeah. Go and look at nature. Study um, populations that live or, living in natural conditions. And, and then look at uh, what we're doing with artificial means and really, really messing up the human genome, and not just the human genome, the plants, the animals, the fish in the ocean, everything, even down to the bacteria. Yeah, so that boils down to two important questions that we always have to put. And that is, what would love do? And what would nature do? And many times it's the same thing. And love is very powerful. Absolutely. Very powerful. Yeah. And yeah. that's what the New World Order is trying to eliminate. Spirituality and love and nurturing parents. And um, that is what transhumanism is. It's to take the humanist out of people and yeah. have willing, submissive slaves who are mentally damaged from all the radiation because it lowers the IQ. And um, and that's where we're headed now. They're destroying yes. people's brains. Yeah, we are on the fast track. I can see that. Yeah. And by the way, humanism yeah. is a Rockefeller thing also. It is. And it's more snake oil, but it's very, very dangerous snake oil because it's irreversible. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, yeah, transhumanism. Uh, when I see all these people with their phones and their stuff, then I think, oh, we are already there. <laughs> um, they've been hijacked. Our children, our yeah. adult children now, um, are completely hooked up to, for instance, the iPods. Those are computers. They're yes. hooked up to universities and police departments and intelligence agencies and homeland security. And they're hooked up to the smart meters. And those smart meters are hooked up to the Inmarsat satellites. And the headquarters is uh, in London. And would you like to explain to people how Inmarsat started in Holland? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just a second. <laughs> Trying to find the screen back. There's the screen. Oh, here I am. Oh, you're yeah. looking for an image? Yeah, I was looking for, for a, a document, yes. <laughs> but anyway, um, our time is almost up. We have one minute. So, Lorraine. Yes. What else? Do you want to say to the audience? Well, I think, I think I'd like to start another movement. You remember the um, kill your television bumper stickers on cars? Well, I'm going to start one called kill your iPhone bumper stickers on cars. <laughs> 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 because they're so dangerous. Um, I just want to say that this is um, a time of transition in the world for humanity. It's a very dangerous time, but it's also a very exciting time. And what I'm watching is President Putin of Russia 
who was KGB, he's done all kinds of things in his life, is doing things that are not just transforming from the Western economy to a Russia, China centric new economy and trading bloc, but he's doing things that should inspire people to demand more of their leaders, horrible leaders, politicians who are just horrible crooks, irresponsible. And so let's look around and see what is working, who is trying to change things, and he believes in re-sovereignization of countries instead of this new world order scheme. And let's um, look around and see who needs support, who needs help. How can we bring that message back to where we are and make it work for us? And um, it's all about education. So I really want to thank um, the gentlemen who have put your network, uh, put us in their network, BB, um, um, Biggie, and his friend and um, yeah. Bill supporters. And mm -hmm. to thank you for inviting me to your program and have an opportunity to inform the Dutch people. And um, uh, I just want to really thank you and thank you for sharing this wonderful journey, Desiree. You've been uh, really a pleasure to meet and to do these interviews with. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lorraine. I really hope to meet you in real life also because, yeah, well, I can feel we can get along great, I think. <laughs> well, when I come to Holland, I just want those really delicious pancakes with apple slices cooked in them. I'll <laughs> bring them to you, no problem. <laughs> Okay. Okay, listeners and viewers, thank you very much for your attention. And Biggie and Mel, thank you for the support, technical support. And next week I'll be, we'll be here again. Who will be my guest? I don't know yet. And I hope that Loren will come back very soon again also. I love it. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. This was the... Minority of one report. <laughs> <laughs>